Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Film Photography Podcast Filmmaking Edition. We're going to be screening the 1982 short Super 8 film, Revenge of Herman. And I will tell you, it's near and dear to my heart because it's the very first Super 8 film I ever shot. I'm going to save the chatter for after the film. And then after the film, I'm going to be joined by none other than Mr. John Casimiro, the star of the film, as well as Mr. Mike Gutterman, who produce the music for this film. Let's roll it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Film Photography Podcast Filmmaker Edition for October 2020, where I'm pulling Super 8 and 8 millimeter and 16 millimeter films out of my personal vault. And before we started rolling, I, I said to my guests, like, oh, gosh, I don't know if anybody wants to see these. I, I don't really know. But my my guests are, are, are two folks that are involved with the production. Mr. John Casimiro, who was in the movie 38 years ago, 1982. 38 years ago. When I recently got the film scanned to HD and I, I, I pulled it into Final Cut to edit um, and I started like, you know, kind of whittling it down to a presentation, I thought, oh, I, I really would like to use a music track. And uh, my, my other guest is Mr. Mike Gutterman. Hi, Mike. Hello. How y'all doing? Mike did the music for the production. <laughs> and I'm friends with Mike Gutterman on Facebook. Uh, and Mike is a musician, artist, film photographer. And I saw Mike's Facebook post that said, hey, I'm doing tracks, electronica <laughs> tracks for productions. Electronic music for productions, volume two. <laughs> right, right. And, uh, a very, very easy name there, right? <laughs> yes, I heard a track. And I'm like, oh, my God, this would be perfect. So I found the track that fits. I sent Mike the link. I contacted John. I said, hey, I'm bringing this little silly production together. 
here it is. Mm -hmm. And I know you have other music on Bandcamp that is more traditional guitar or rock and roll. Uh, a lot of it is, uh, it's all kind of a very simple music, uh, very simple melodies, very simple, uh, just uh, song structure. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of them that's just solo guitar. And, uh, but I, I wanted to, I, I was basically using, uh, I basically wrote them for my own podcast. And then I thought, well, maybe other people could use them. And I, I wanted them to be music that wouldn't uh, take away from the content of what the person's trying to put across, you know, more like soundtrack type, you know, very simple stuff. Like if someone's speaking over it, it doesn't necessarily distract you from what they're saying or whatever. So yeah, it's background music. That's the best way I could uh, <laughs> describe right. it. Yeah. So you, you, what inspired you to create two volumes and then make it available to the public for their own productions? Well, um, I just had a lot of music sitting around that I wasn't doing anything with. And I thought, well, you know, I might as well get it out there. And I'm not really, it's not really music you could technically sell, like, or try to put out as like a, you know, a, like, I don't think I would release a CD. I don't, you know, right. I don't think the kids really do that these days anymore. Right. So, but, uh, and so it just seemed like just a kind of a, a cool thing to do where maybe, uh, and you know, uh, the, when people have used it, like such as yourself, Mike, I just got a huge th a thrill out of it. It's a, it's a, it's a real kick to see your music be used in some sort of, in somebody else's, you know, to help somebody else's work. So yeah. uh, I just got a, it's a real thrill. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts about, you know, I mean, here we are tail end of 2020 and I, I am seeing a surge of, um, you know, student age folks shooting movies on film. What are your thoughts about, you know, shooting movies on film in the digital age? And this might sound cheesy, Mike, I don't know, but, uh, <laughs> but like when I look back at like uh, the film footage I got of our vacations that I shot the last couple of years on uh, super eight and then double eight or whatever, it, it looks to me like it almost looks, I know it's, everyone says it's timeless and it's the vintage look or whatever, but to me, it almost looks like how my memories remember the scene, you know, like I, my, your memories aren't sharp and super clear, like a digital uh, right. camera would put out. I just, I feel like it just, it almost is, is the way I see uh, my memories feel like, um, you know, how the way that it's, it's I don't know, I'm, I'm having a hard time getting my words around that, but it just, it felt yeah. like it's, it's how my memories look, you know, and, uh, uh, but why kids are doing it these days, man, everything, uh, everything that we um, had when we uh, from back in our day is cool again, Mike. So I guess that means we're cool again, right? Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Do you think that the the format limitations of a Super 8 or Double Eight, regardless of or even 16 millimeter, the fact that you're restricted to that three minutes, do you think that makes the shooter before they even shoot know that they have X amount of time and that they have to utilize that time? efficiently so folks are maybe not even knowing it but folks are like almost editing it in their heads while they're shooting it because they know they can't just keep rolling and rolling and rolling mm -hmm. actually i think that was what i enjoyed most about it the, the limitations uh of it because you really had to think about each scene and uh you, you know i would uh, i think on your advice when i when i would hit the shut the hit the hit the the shutter button or whatever you want to call it on those things. But, uh, you know, I would count to three or five, like one, two, three or whatever, and then let off of it, just make every scene short and quick. And that really did help uh, me, uh, you know, get like, I, I shot a whole week vacation on, you know, like uh, it was, I had two cartridges, six minutes, you know, and even then I, I, I didn't feel like uh, I, I missed anything. Or, uh, I, I liked, I liked the limitation of it. I think it actually helps and uh, it ends up making you, make a more intriguing film than I remember back in the day uh, when my, my college friends and I, we'd go to Florida, we'd have a camcorder with like, you know, three two hour tapes and like you look back on those things now and it's really only about six minutes of it that's worth watching anyway <laughs> you know so right. it's like yeah, yeah John in the case of this first movie I ever made 1982 Revenge of Herman did you even have a recollection of it <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I remember uh, you coming to my house and kind of throwing the ideas out. And, and I, I can't remember whether it was scripted or sc storyboarded or if we kind of just winged it. Do you remember? No, I don't. But when I watch it, I see it as for folks who will be watching this channel, I'm going to be premiering the um, Attack of the Potato People, which is an eight minute film, which I did for a class. And the Revenger Herman is almost like a test run of that. This was the first film that I, I, you know, grabbed my dad's Super 8 camera and said, oh, hey, let me try 
to put a little film together. A question that uh, all of us want to know is uh, the little creature, Herman, where did you get that and what is it? Ah, well, it's a bank. It's, uh, I got it. At, remember Jungle Habitat? For folks who don't know the sad story of Jungle Habitat, <laughs> what, what was that? Well, uh, Jungle Habitat was basically one of the first uh, safari type places where you'd get in your car and drive through and there were, you know, monkeys and giraffes and it was very unorganized and very chaotic. Um, it, it's no longer around, of course, and it, it actually stayed abandoned for a number of years. Um, I, I actually read a story on it on Weird New Jersey. Um, you can still go there and kind of kind of rummage through the remains of what's left of jungle habitat. But yeah, it was just a it was just a souvenir. It was it was a, a monkey bank basically. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, you go to jungle habitat, you drive through the safari, and then basically you exit through the gift shop. Yeah. When you leave, you go through the gift shop, and you saw a monkey bank. And yeah, because like it. one of the last one of the last exhibits were were the baboons. And okay. they would like jump all over your cars and <laughs> we'd have it. You know, so. uh, pull the antenna off your car. Yeah, all that kind yeah, of stuff. They were cr it was crazy. Yeah, there's got to be some uh, YouTube video of it somewhere, I would think. I, I want to thank every, you know folks that are still watching. I want to <laughs> thank you for indulging me during this Halloween season. And uh, um, uh, John, do you have any? Uh, by the way, for for long time FPP listeners, John is the track man. This is the big reveal of the show. <laughs> oh yeah! Can you do uh, like a track band sound? Well, it, it's it's uh, yeah. It was so funny uh, earlier when you were talking. You kept saying the word tracks. It was very hard to not answer you and say yeah. Uh, I want to thank everyone for watching and look. I, we will look for your your comments below throughout October. I'm going to be bringing more cra more crazy films to you. So um, let us know what you think. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.